All right, guys, this is it. Episode one of our official MCT podcast. MCT, obviously, for Michael, Chris, Tade. And this is episode one. This is the pilot. This is the kickoff, jump ball, tip off, uh, you know, first pitch. Here we go. Any other sports cliches you got on top of your head? That's what this is tonight. Uh, I'm. I can't even say how excited I am to do this, and uh, I know my co-hosts are just as excited. So uh, I'm gonna give them give them free reign to uh, just kind of introduce themselves once again. I know we already did some intros, but this is episode one. This is special. Every this is special. So let's just get into it, Michael. Um, my name is Michael. I have beard. I like sports, and we're gonna have. <laughs> I have no idea, Tane. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm Tade. I'm the guy that likes to throw money in the trash can by sports betting. <laughs> so as uh, as the whole sports world and the world is aware, uh, this past week we had uh, what is known as the big game, the Super Bowl, uh, all these great things. So we are, um, as, as you know, everybody knows we are partnered with, uh, we are part of the three C media family. So they already did a Super Bowl reaction show. So we're not going to dwell on it too long, but we, I mean, we were there. We want to give parts, you know, it happened. We watched it. Uh, I don't think any of us were happy with the way the game played out, but you know what, to be fair, as Craig and B Scott said, when we did our preview show, you know, congrats to the bucks. Cause we all took the chiefs. So of course we knew it was going to go the way of the bucks. Um, and they did have a special year. You have to tip your caps to them. Um, but, you know, first action out of the Super Bowl has to be Pat Mahomes' performance uh, out here trying to play Superman. He wasn't even just playing Superman. I mean, he's he's out here playing Iron Man, Thor, Hulk, like Hawkeye. He, he's out here being all the Avengers at once and ain't nobody there trying to help him out. Um, so, yeah, that's, I think, the big takeaway for just about everybody. I mean, the man just straight made some throws that, I I could not put in the words, especially when he was, you know, in the air, falling down and still threw a dart at a man's face. So the big thing here is that Pat, it wasn't Patrick Mahomes' fault. I know it's a team loss, but I have I don't know what happened there. Just like the Monstars took all of the game from the Chiefs wide receivers. It was just unbelievable to actually see that. Yeah, I have to agree there. Patrick Mahomes was literally out there acting like Michael Vick with how he throws to people's hands, trying to break their hands. Pass is accurate. Patrick Mahomes (laughs) threw it to their heads. They still couldn't catch it. Right to them. I mean, we saw multiple balls hit face masks and not be caught. Not regardless of how the ball got there. And you're talking about, you know, sidearm literally laying on the ground so there were two screenshots that i saw from the super bowl that will i feel like live on in infamy and make will make me smile and be sad at the same time for both of them one is obviously the pat mahomes elbow almost on the ground completely lateral throwing a ball 30 yards down the field and hitting a dude in the face mask the other one i saw i don't know if you guys saw it but there was a play on third down where literally uh mahomes is in shotgun and the ball has not reached his arm like the ball has not reached his hands yet. He has not caught the snap. And you can see three Buccaneers already getting past the offensive lineman. Like, that's insane. That's just insane. Um, so other th- a couple other things we want to talk about the Super Bowl. Uh, I want to raise the question to you guys. Did Tom Brady deserve the MVP award? And I, it's a heated sort of topic every year it's a big question mark because you know 99 percent of the time it goes to the winning quarterback it's an easy easy decision but um in my opinion it's a hard no i i know i'm salty you can call me a hater all you want i can't stand tom brady i will die on that hill i cannot stand the man but i don't think he won this game i think blaine gabbert could have done what tom brady did in the super bowl i'm sorry but I didn't see Tom Brady do anything special. So in my opinion, in an unprecedented move, Todd Bowles should have gotten the MVP award as the defensive coordinator of the Tampa Bay Bucks. Listen, that man court. I've never seen a game plan drawn up and executed better in a Super Bowl than that game plan. They just held the Kansas City offense, one of the most prolific offenses I think we will ever see in football to nine points in the Super Bowl and held them out of the end zone for four quarters. Was the last team to do that? That's insane. 
Well, the big thing that I saw during that game is that Patrick Mahomes has never lost by double digits until that game and has never been kept out of double digit scoring until that game. So the D entire defense deserved that MVP. Like just make the, I think I'm all co def- like MVPs on that one. But if I had to give it to one person, I'd probably have to say Antoine Winfield jr. Just for that taunting penalty he had against Tyree kill <laughs> with the deuces. <laughs> that was just legendary. And just the entire game, everybody was chippy. It was fun. If you, weren't a Chiefs fan but yeah Tom Brady he just all he had to do was just play safe and that's all he did all right so I'm going to help you guys do some math here a little bit of counting one two three four five six seven Tom Brady should Tom Brady deserve that MVP award if we look at the scoreboard team had the most points that wins Tom Brady led that offense still Tom Brady was that glue if you put Jameis Winston back on that team. They're not going to the Super Bowl. Jameis Winston. Tom Brady deserved that MVP award in that Super Bowl for just being a good game manager. Nah, dude, they're gonna eat that W with Jameis Winston out there. <laughs> you right? Oh man. <laughs> so I'm trying to. I'm having a little, uh, little, little difficulty here. So we might come back to. Uh, we did our predictions on. Uh, Craig Crash's uh, Super Bowl show. I can't seem to find the document that listed all of our predictions, so I don't. We're really all remember. wrong. It doesn't matter. The so. only yeah. I will say this. I will say this. The only one that I remember, and I remember thinking it during the game, and I was kind of tallying yards as the game wore on, and I was like, "Yes, I think I hit it." Was the question was would the Chiefs rush for eighty more yards? And I said yes because Pat Mahomes would get some rushing yards and. Damn it all. They got over 100 yards, and I know Pat Mahomes had like 30 rushing yards in his handful of attempts. Now, that doesn't take into account his 497 yards running behind the line of scrimmage away from the Tampa defense. But, yeah, I, I wanted to pat myself on the back just a little bit there for, uh, for calling that one out and using, using the old big nougat there. Yeah, Pat Mahomes easily had over 500 yards rushing there. I don't know why they didn't cal- tally him running for his absolute life away from Jason Pierre Paul and the other defense. Um, the one thing that I remember was like the one and a half sacks. And I said that it was going to be mm. very tough to get well, Patrick Mahomes three, down. And, think, and we hit that. Yeah, yeah. They, they hit that. Yeah. But I also said it was just going to be really hard to get there if they did get there. Yep. And man, like you said, 497 yards evading the pass rush, pulling all the Tony Romo cards out of his hat. It was just insane that it, it, could, it should have been more if it was anybody else back there it would have been more oh yeah but it was just insane you know i feel so, bad for the guy that bet on sammy watkins for five thousand to win mvp so <laughs> at least we didn't bet on that five thousand five thousand are you just going for the money it was great i don't even think he played a snap did he i don't think so I don't think he so. played i just don't i just don't think he played very very much so, um, it could have so, been worse it could have been pat mcafee losing 30 grand on the coin flip <laughs> Sorry, so, yeah. so 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 he put five thousand down on Watkins winning the MVP. What were the odds? Yeah. What would what would have been the payout? Probably like twenty five k at least. Yeah, he had, it was like some like a plus like seven hundred or something on those odds. He would sure. made money. I yeah. I will say a big shout out to the guy who put down eight dollars on the biggest parlay oh, I've ever oh. seen in my life. It yeah. was like uh, Usman to beat uh, Masvidal, the Tampa Bay Lightning to win the Stanley cup, the Dodgers to win the world series, uh, oh. the Lakers to win the NBA championship. And then the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to win the super bowl got paid out $25,000. Shout out to that legend. That's insane. Oh, yeah. I, I would never make another bet. Like I, like I would hit that and it'd be like, sweet. I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, one of the fun things about every uh, sports season coming to an end, uh, what everybody likes to do is uh, looking forward to the next season. It's it's one of the ways you wrap a bow on whatever season just ended. And so we're going to we're going to take some time and we're going to do that. We're going to look ahead now to uh, the 2021-2022 NFL season. And uh, the first thing that we got to talk about is this uh, this rotating quarterback carousel that uh, I think we're going to see in free agency as that window opens up. And uh, two big names are out there. And, uh, you know, do we think either of them or both of them are going to be on the move? And that's the that's Deshaun Watson in the, with the Houston Texans and Carson Wentz out of Philly with the Eagles there. Um, do we think they're going to move? 
at this point, if we're, let's talk Watson first, at this point with Deshaun Watson, I, I'm really actually going to say I don't think he goes anywhere because Houston just seems to refuse to answer the phone. And so if Houston doesn't answer the phone and nobody, it doesn't matter how big the deal is, somebody could be calling with 10 firsts. And if they're not answering the phone, they're never going to hear that deal. And so I'll take it a step further. I think Watson doesn't move. And I think Watson sits to start next year. Why would he go out there? What does he have to gain? Everybody knows how good he could be. He doesn't have to go audition for other teams. Every team in the NFL is salivating right now trying to get their hands on Deshaun Watson besides maybe Kansas city and no about Kansas city. Like every other team is probably thinking, what if we get Deshaun Watson for the next 10 plus years? So every team is out. So he has no reason to go out and play. He clearly doesn't want to play and win for Houston. Like I say, they hold on to him because they're stubborn. And I say he sits because he's going to call their bluff. Yeah, I'm going to agree with you on the on Deshaun Watson just because they're with how stubborn Houston's been. They just lost JJ Watt. They need to sell merch somehow. So I think they're just going to hang on to him and hold him and, and see if he holds out, which we all know he's going to, and maybe try to move him after the draft and getting into preseason. They'll probably look to move him then, just because that will be the the final nail in the coffin as they say where they know he's not going to play they know he's not going to move and just one of them's got to break i don't think deshaun watson will sit once the season starts because his contract is just made in a way that he's just gonna lose so much money no matter what i do think it's sad for the fact that houston could get so much for Deshaun Watson, but their management is so bad, they won't get any return worth it because they're just horrible. So I think they're probably just going to sell on him, thinking we can get the mother load for him. But in the end, he can just do whatever he wants. He can he can gain 500 pounds and be like, oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> ah, it's my bad. I put on a little too much weight there and just play horribly if you wanted to. He can just throw games. He'll get fined. He'll lose money, but do you want to win or do you want to be on a losing Houston team for the next five years? Yeah. I mean, it's going to turn into Marcus Russell real quick and <laughs> study, study some blank tapes, like but he's got to, I mean, he's got to, I mean, and Watson also has to look out for his health and his longevity. He's already torn his ACL once and come back from that. Um, I mean, he's got to do what's best for him. And, and it's pretty obvious to everybody besides Houston's management, that Houston is not the best for him right now anymore. It's just not. And you know what? I I really, I actually do feel for the Houston fans because man, it's gotta be gut wrenching for you. And you gotta be torn as much as you want your team to be good and you want to win and you want to win with Deshaun Watson. You you think that any logical fan can kind of see why he would want out. And, you know, you kind of would want the best for him even if it's in another, you know, in another organization. So it's gotta be tough for them. It's gotta be tough for him. The only people that don't seem to have any issues with anything is the Houston management. They seem to think, Hey, everything's fine. Um, But so if we're going to talk Carson Wentz, I think he's out. I I don't think there's any chance he stays in Philly. Uh, Both sides want out. Both sides are wheeling and dealing. I think the only holdup at this point is just Philly's trying to get the bag. Philly's trying to get as much as they can. And I don't think teams are going to play that way. Um, I know the Colts were one of the teams rumored to be in on the Wentz, you know, hype and trying to try to pair him back up with Frank Reich, where he was, you know, he where Wentz did have his most success in his career so far, his early career. Um, but I think uh, I think the news kind of came out that the Colts made their final offer, whatever that may be, and we'll see where the chips lay. And you know what? That really doesn't surprise me from a guy like Ballard. Ballard doesn't play that kind of game. Ballard's not going to come to a team and beg and and try to wheel and deal. He's going to say, hey, here's here's where I value this guy. Here's what I'm giving up for him. Where you at? So I do think he's on the move. I don't see it in Indy, but there's a lot of teams I think that may take a shot on the guy if the price is right. Especially because I believe his asking price was a couple of first round picks and a higher overall pick, if not a mid tier pick uh, to go on top of that. 
And it's just an insane asking price for a man with paper skin and glass bones to where he has not proven he can play a full 16 game season in a few years. And his backup quarterback had to come in and win the Super Bowl. Right. Now, granted, he was playing an MVP caliber season. He was still on the MVP short list with being injured that year. But I don't know if that asking price is worth it for a guy who's only going to play 10, 11 games. Now, if in a place like Indy with a better offensive line or just oh, who else was in on it? I believe the uh, the Jets were in on it for a little bit too, right? Yeah. And it's just crazy the teams that are going after these quarterbacks right now. Some of them have high over, higher overall picks and some of them already have guys in place. So it's just going to be weird to see where Wentz goes. And if it's actually going to be an improvement for him over Philadelphia, or if he should have just, you know, beat out Jalen Hurts and continued his career in Philly. Yeah, the Eagles front office thinks that they have a Deshaun Watson on their hands when in reality they don't. Maybe they try to swap him out for a QB like Jimmy Garoppolo with San Francisco who's trying to make a move up, but I don't think San Francisco would want him. Maybe they go for a Mitch Trubisky trade. You know, try to get a new quarterback in there. Chicago's not going to go for that. They have Nick Foles, the guy that won the Super Bowl for them. So I think Eagles don't really have any options available to them that they want for their asking price. So they're going to be stuck with a guy and is what, $25 million a year cap hit? Man, is it really that high? Yeah, he's yeah. he got his contract already. So he's he's set. He, good for him. He's got oh, his yeah. money. Bad news for the Eagles and Eagles fans. You're stuck with a QB who can't stay on the field and who keeps regressing. And who couldn't outperform Big Nick Nick. <laughs> and so the next thing, you know, in, in a regular year, in a non-COVID pandemic year, uh, when the season wraps up, you get right into draft season. You get right into pro days and combines. So we're going to talk about kind of the what the lack of a combine made do for the upcoming draft here in April. And, it, you know, I'm not going to lie. This is not my area of expertise. This is why I don't do this show by myself. We've got three, uh, we got three hosts of this show for a reason. So I'm going to toss, I'm going to toss the ball over when we're talking about the NFL combine, I'm going to toss the ball over to uh, one of the more experienced members, the M in the MCT podcast, uh, so, yeah, what I mean, Michael, really, like, what, what do you think the, the lack of a combine is going to do, not just for these kids, but for, for the NFL landscape for the next year? Well, the big thing is they're not going to have that one on one time. See, when it comes to, like, the on-field stuff, there's enough tape out there, and you're going to have pro days where it's going to make up for that. You know, I've heard the pro days are going to be a little bit longer than what they normally are, a little bit more in depth. So that should make up for that in a much smaller setting. But the one on one time that a team has with the prospect to try and get to know their player as much as they can in like 30 minutes. That's going to be really hard because you're going to have some guys that maybe have some character issues like in Antonio Brown that it might not pop up. And that could be a long-term issue rather than a short-term issue. And without getting that one-on-one -on -one time, it might be a little bit harder to jump on a guy who might have been a little bit questionable but had like, the right mindset that was going to come in and that was going to work and not study blank blitz tapes. Um, but speaking of pro days, I mean, you, there's a guy who already had his earlier today, and that was Trevor Lawrence. And his pro day, though, it was kind of weird watching it. Um, but I will say um, Jordan Palmer, who was the big QB guru, he worked with the Deshaun Watsons, the Sam Darnolds, Josh Allens coming into the draft and helping them prepare for the next level. He set that man up for absolute success. He was extremely accurate. Every route was thrown on point. But when they moved up into the red zone, that's when I noticed that he kind of had a little bit of a concern with overthrowing his targets. And that's why I just kind of, it started kind of a little, a little concerning, but that's all coachable. It's not really a problem. But I, ah, I just dropped my phone with my notes on it. Um, the big thing that is that with towards the end of that throwing session where all was, it was just pretty normal. Um, they had him go back. And it was kind of the show off portion of the pro today and have him do some deep drop backs and throw some deep balls that were on a rope. And the last thing that I saw 
was Jordan Palmer calling out a broken play and having him go back and forth a little bit of Pat Mahomes. And he ripped it off his back foot to his receiver 50 yards downfield and hit him right in the chest. And Damn. that was just blew my mind. Like, yep, I'm a big Justin Fields fan, but Trevor Lawrence is the real deal, especially after that. And you know, everyone wants to, wants to do these pro comparisons. I don't like putting that much pressure on a person, but I saw a lot of Aaron Rodgers potential with how effortlessly that ball was leaving his hand, especially while on the move. He has the talent. The surgery that he's getting on his non-dominant arm is a little bit of a concern because in the test, like they were making some comments about how his weight it looked like he had kind of slimmed down a little bit because he's not really lifting because he has to have that surgery. So we're, hopefully that isn't too much of an issue leading into his first NFL season. <laughs> um, going to go ahead and transition though. Um, just speaking into other some other pro days coming down the line, um, Chris. I know already know which one you're going to pick, <laughs> but. I'm going to go ahead and say, just speaking on Justin Fields in Ohio State, I'm always excited to see what is going to come out of that university this year. I think Justin Fields is going to solidify himself as a number two pick, but we just have to see if he can put do something better because Urban Meyer is a big Ohio State guy. But I mean, during the Jared Lawrence's pro day, I didn't see him leave Dabo Sweeney's side, so it would be tough to see if Justin Fields can swoon him, bring him back to his university and see if maybe Justin Fields can be that surprise number one overall pick. So first I do want to say, I thought it was hilarious that you're like, I I don't like to make pro comparisons and I don't like to put the pressure on this guy, but I'm going to make a pro comparison to arguably the most (laughs) quarterback we've ever seen step on a football field. Yeah. (laughs) So that made me laugh. Um, But the pro day I'm looking forward to the most it's obvious. It, it's super simple. Just think about it for a second. Chirp, chirp. Go watch those red Ball State Cardinals, baby. Your 2020 MAC champions, your Arizona Bowl champions. Uh, this is going to be the most exciting pro day probably in school history. I know um, let's not pretend like they haven't had NFL talent before. Uh, 2008, they had Nate Davis lead them to an undefe- uh, you know an undefeated season until the bowl until they lost their bowl game. Um, I mean, hell, even here in Indy, Jonathan Newsom was a like not cornerstone, but was a key cog in the Colts' defensive system for a couple of years there. Coming out of Ball State, he was a fourth round pick coming out of Ball State. The Colts just drafted Danny Pinter last year. He's their backup center in the fifth round. So like, I know Indy loves their Ball State Cardinals, but like. Ball State has played, and oh my god, I can't believe I forgot Willie Sneed, who's made himself a solid NFL career for six plus years now, and a couple of different teams. He's had some great games in Baltimore, and you know, Keith Wenning uh, never really found a spot. He floated around a lot, but I mean, he still was drafted. I mean, so just in the last 10 years, that's that's a handful of guys that have come out of a little school in the MAC, sitting here in downtown Muncie, Indiana, and you know, and in the middle of nowhere. So yeah, I'm looking forward to this pro day just because it, it, it's, it's the final culmination of this historic season that they just had winning their first ever bowl game, winning the Mac title for the first time in 20 some years. So there, I mean, the hype is real when you talk about the Cardinals. So yeah, I can't wait to see what kind of pro day stuff they get to do this year when, when they may actually have some eyes on them more so than in years past. That's a really good point you made there, Chris. Uh, you always have to look at schools that always aren't on people's radars that weren't top 25, you know, schools in the nation. But if you're the NFL, if you're an NFL team and you want NFL talent, there's one school to go to. <laughs> Same color as this shirt. It's called Alabama, who have had the most student athletes drafted from their program in recent years. So Roll time. there's only one to go to. <laughs> No, nah, you don't have to go just Alabama's because they're going to get picked off easy. But you know the QB is going to get drafted easily. Maybe by the Colts. We don't know. But I think Alabama's pro days, you know, good to watch. You know, SEC didn't have that many games as they usually do this year because of COVID. It's a good opportunity to see players work it out a little bit. Well, I mean, speaking of Mac Jones, I kind of want to transition into the Senior Bowl that I feel like kind of just went under the radar a little bit this year. And while a, a whole lot of the Gee, top thanks. prospects didn't really play, <laughs> thanks, Rona. 
Um, but Mac Jones actually didn't play in that game. He actually had a sprained ankle and did not perform, even though I think he was trying to play, but they kind of got shut down. There's a couple of players who got hurt during that practice week. From what I've been told, you know, it doesn't really affect his status. I still think he's probably a higher to mid second round pick right now. I don't think he goes in the first round just because of the talent he had around him, maybe made him look a lot better. That kind of brings sparks of like Johnny Manziel in it, especially with how Mike Evans has performed and Johnny Manziel has flamed out of the league. So I don't know if I trust Mac Jones too much, but a good pro day might be able to solidify that. Um, some other guys who actually made a couple of impacts, uh, Ian Book was, I believe, the starter um, for his team. And he had some flashes. Notre Dame guy, we're all Indiana guys here and want to see some Indiana guys succeed. But he struggled massively with the deep ball. If it was in 25 yards, more game manager stuff, he was dead on. But anything past that, it had a tendency to float. And that was a problem. So the arm is there, but if you have to coach him down and kind of rein him in a little bit and get him a little bit more accurate on that, which makes him perfect as a day three of the draft kind of project piece. Another guy who just, I mean, highlights have been popped up all over Twitter, um, University of North Carolina running back Michael Carter. I saw him take on five guys and win. The last guy actually had to knock him out, and he was still on his feet. He was still running. If that was closer to the middle of the field, he probably would have kept running. So while maybe not like a full-time guy, I definitely think he's going to be a good change of pace back, a little bit more like a Jonathan Taylor type. He's kind of shifty, but he will run you over if he gets the opportunity to do so. And then a guy who may not have had the best of pro, um, sorry, senior bowls to really kind of show off his talent is Ohio State inside linebacker, tough Borland. Now Ohio State has had a record for the most inside linebackers drafted per draft. I think it was an average of about five per draft with eyes of Ohio State linebackers. But the big thing is, is this guy is smaller. He's a little bit slower. So physically, he's probably not the most like eye drop, like eyes popping, jaw dropping inside linebacker on the market. But he is a very smart kid. And he has these intangibles that should make up for it. Kind of like um, Colts fans. I remember Gary Brackett, a smaller guy, but he was mm -hmm. always a step ahead of what you're wanting to do. So that kind of made up for it. So we'll see if he can take those intangibles and maybe compensate for some other shortness for shortfalls in his game. You just had to talk about an Ohio state guy. You just had, I to. talked about Ohio couldn't state guy having a bad day. All right. I'm not just yourself. like, couldn't help yourself. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> uh, but you know, oh, I, I do. I do want to talk. I do want to kind of piggyback off of your when you talked about UNC's running back Michael Carter, and you know how maybe he's not a full time back. I think that's more than okay because I think the NFL is kind of transitioning away from an every down full time back because I think that's what's killing the shelf life of running backs and making them only last three four years on average. So there, you know, teams are trying to find ways to take the load off of their star running backs and and kind of you know preserve them a little bit longer. You're seeing teams employ multiple running backs in different situations and and you know you don't just have your adrian peterson who's yep he's my first down back shocker my second down back oh i, I have a third and one who am i handing the ball off to uh oh Adrian peterson you don't have that guy much anymore so i think you know if he can fill a niche role um i, I mean more power to him and uh, now, now we can we can all rejoice because now we're going to talk about the super fun thing, the combine and draft and pre-draft stuff is all good and stuff. But let's talk about the draft. Let's talk about the draft. So I just want to talk. We don't have to go too far into it, but I just I, I just want one kind of surprise, not necessarily a prediction, but one one surprise you you, you think most people aren't thinking about but may happen. Um, so or, or I'm sorry, a, a surprise. If it let's let's go by this way, the, a surprise if it happens. Words are tough. This is episode one. It's the pilot. We're we're ironing all this out, and I'm not good at ironing. Um, but, so a surprise move if it actually happens, and I have two. One for each of my favorite teams. So I will be surprised if the Indianapolis Colts trade up in the draft at all under any circumstances, because simply put, it's not Chris Ballard's style. He loves his draft capital he loves finding that diamond in the rough that nobody's talking about I'm not sure if you guys have heard of a guy like darius leonard 
or you know uh julian blackman or you know uh uh i mean anthony walker has been great you know he had a bad year but like i mean he has hit on a lot of these later rounds kind of guys uh and he's obviously really hit on darius leonard um, so I'll just be surprised if they give up any draft capital to move up because again, that's just not Ballard's style. Ballard goes after his guys when he, you know, when, when they, when he gets the picks, he doesn't trade up. So I'd just be surprised. And then I will be surprised. It hurts me to say, I will be surprised if the Green Bay Packers actually draft a weapon for Aaron Rodgers. I'll be surprised because it's been near 20 years. And I kid you not, I tell you, Aaron Rodgers, that man, that myth legend goat wonderful human being has never in his nfl career thrown the ball to a first round wide receiver he has never thrown the football to a first round wide receiver are you kidding me so why would that change now I know he kind of called them out when they lost the NFC title game and he, you know, kind of made us all think for a couple of days that, oh God, could he really leave Green Bay? I don't think he's going anywhere, but I think he was trying to light a fire in the organization to get them to wake the hell up and, and do something for him. Who knows if they'll actually listen? So I, I'd be surprised just because why would they do it now? Why didn't they do it five years ago, 10 years ago? So I'd be surprised. Knowing that the Packers are probably end up taking like a left tackle after signing uh, David Bakhtari to the largest O line deal in NFL history. Um, they just, I don't know why. They just, the big thing, too, if I would think about if I was the Packers, is that you just drafted Jordan Love. He's your future. We all know that. And that was a fine, I, while it was annoying at first, that was a fine pick. But you have to give him weapons. Otherwise, he's going to fail and he's going to struggle for the first few years like Aaron Rodgers did because he had all the talent in the world, but he had to carry his team. Yeah. And I don't think Jordan Loves is another Aaron Rodgers or Brett Favre. So they have to get something, not just for Rodgers this year, but from Jordan Love in the next 10. Mm -hmm. But uh, my big surprise, I don't think the Jets are going to take a QB, number two. I think the Jets are either going to trade down or they're going to get the Heisman Trophy winner out of Alabama to compliment Sam Darnold and give two. Sam Darnold at number two. I think if the Jets are going to take anybody else other than a quarterback, it'll be the Heisman Trophy winner. But they'll probably end up trading down and picking him up later in the draft. Sure. But I don't – I just – just because Sam Darnold hasn't moved yet, there hasn't really been that conversation around him yet. Like everyone thinks he's going to move. But because we haven't really heard any rumored offers – whether it's just because we're waiting for Watson and Wentz to fall and then they go after Sam Darnold or what, but I think the Jets, just because they're the freaking Jets, might hang on to Sam Darnold and but finally give him a weapon, finally do something so Sam Darnold can stop seeing ghosts and have a reliable target other than Robbie Anderson to throw the ball to. Which you Robbie Anderson's not even on the Jets anymore, is he? He's on the Carolina Panthers now, right? Right. You think the Jets would be smart enough to actually trade down and wait for their guy, though? Come on. That's a lot of credit you're giving them. Especially Adam Gase with the uh, – well, he's not there anymore, but just they hired that man with the uh, crazy yeah. eyes. <laughs> crazy eyes. Uh, for a safe pick, probably, I think the Rams will probably go for a wide receiver to help solidify their offense with Matt Stafford. Their defense is already stacked. I think that first round pick probably goes to some offensive weapon for my hot take. Uh, I don't think the Jaguars are a very good franchise. They're a poorly run franchise. Uh, I think urban Meyer is an arrogant man who will not pick Trevor Lawrence. He'll want them not to pick him. They'll want his guys from Ohio state expect them not to draft Trevor Lawrence. That's my hot take. Well the big thing so, so, with that pick is that Justin Fields was not there when Urban Meyer was there. That was a Ryan Day pickup. Ryan Day convinced him to leave and come to Ohio State after Dwayne Haskins that went to the NFL draft. That was a Ryan Day pickup. So I don't think that Urban Meyer is completely sold on his guy. Yeah, it'd be nice to have that Ohio State guy from the Ohio State coach because um, who remembers his years at Florida with Tim Tebow? nowadays i mean he just um, won two titles there but yeah you're right da, 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 da. oh h um but i 
just because of the way he was acting with Davo Sweeney, like most coaches don't attend these pro days, like the head coaches, they normally send scouts or coordinators. He said, he stood there right next to Davo Sweeney the entire time and did not leave his side talking to Davo Sweeney about Trevor Lawrence. The only reason why I don't think that he's going to go away from Trevor Lawrence, he might, but I don't think he will. It happen. That's why it's a hot take. Okay, so our last bit of NFL goodiness in our uh, the, to wrap up the 2019 2020 season. No, 2020 2021. Season. I can't number. Still episode one, guys. Bear with me. Uh, we're all Colts fans. I want to talk about the Colts. I had to find a way to kind of sneak a little Colts conversation into this one. I, I pat myself on the back again. I think like I did a good job. So I want to know what one thing the Indianapolis Colts took away from the playoffs as a whole. So not necessarily just their game against Buffalo that they could have won and played very well and played well enough to win in Buffalo. In. But what did they learn sitting on their couch just like the rest of us watching the playoffs play out? And mine's an easy one. Mine's a very obvious one championships are no longer won by defenses. They are won in the trenches on both sides of the ball. Championships are officially won in the trenches. Tampa Bay just showed that and they laid the blueprint out there for everybody because they just protected a 43 year old immobile quarterback who cannot step out of the pocket and does not release the ball quickly. He needs time for his weapons to get down the field and they love to throw the deep ball in Tampa. So they need, they have routes that take forever so they had to protect Tom Brady and at the same time go and get after these young mobile quarterbacks on the other end. And they did it. And that's a huge factor as to why they just won the Super Bowl. So, you know, when I was looking at the playoff stats, they had in their four playoff games, they had 10 team sacks. So do the math. That's 2.3 a game. Not not amazing, but also solid. And those are just sacks. That's not QB hits. That's not pressures, knockdowns, altered throws, quick releases, anything like that. What's most impressive about that stat is eight of those 10 sacks came in the NFC title game and the Super Bowl. So they had they got to Aaron Rodgers five times and dropped him. Five. And they brought Patrick Mahomes down for sacks three times. And as we mentioned earlier, he ran for 497 yards behind the line of scrimmage, just avoiding that pass rush. So you look at that, you look at, they had 10 sacks in those four playoff games, eight in the last two. Like I said, they only gave up six sacks of Tom Brady in those four games. So in my opinion, my Colts hot take, if you will, is their new number one priority is left tackle. And I'm going to tell you right now, I do not want to see number 56, lined up at left tackle. I don't want to see Quentin Nelson over there. He is too damn good where he is. He is a generational. I mean, he's done nothing. He's made played three seasons, made three first team all pros. I'm sorry. Like, don't move that man. That man is he's stonewall, right? Leave him where he is. Go find you a left tackle. I know it's the most important piece of the offensive line, but if you move him to left tackle, you, you don't know just how un- it might make him a little uncomfortable. It, it might, he might dip a little bit, who knows? And then you've still got to find a guard to fill his spot. So now all of a sudden you're, you're moving two pieces around and you don't know what that's going to do to the, to the chemistry of that unit. Who knows? Whereas if you leave him there, you plug in a tackle, the chemistry is still there. You figure it all out. I think it gels better that way. My big things are going to be, I'm going to have to agree with you. It's definitely going to be the trenches. And we just saw a Super Bowl where Pat Mahomes was running for his life. And even though he is probably the biggest talent out there, there's no one else like him. You can't put anybody else back there and have him have the same kind of performance. So when you're running for your life like that as a quarterback, that's not a recipe for success. And that's not a way to have a long, long career. Ask Michael Vick about that. All right. It was another big RG three. RG3 was running for his Russell Wilson is getting beat up and he's finally speaking out about it. So these mobile quarterbacks, while that seemed to be the wave, they're getting hit a lot. And the man who's played 22 years in the league, just won a title being a statue. So you got to get some pass help, um, 
some offensive line help. Left tackle for sure needs to be filled. Pass rush is going to be key. A guy like a J.J. Watt who's currently on the market right now. Bring him in. Entice that man. Brack up the Brinks truck if you have to. Heck with it. Just throw it at him. Like do something to bring in J.J. Watt to Indy. Keep him from playing with his brother. And have get a guy who's not going to throw the ball away on third and long to lose the game and set us up the fourth down hell mary you need a qb you don't need someone who's going to be like a patrick Mahomes or a tom brady you just need a guy who's going to be like an alex smith who's going to manage the game not turn the ball over and keep the offense moving and also run the damn ball with jonathan taylor so you have this great piece you just need one or two or three guys to really go on a big time run and with houston basically dead in the water jacksonville is jacksonville you have you really your only competition is titans so you have to get guys who are going to be able to beat tennessee and succeed in the postseason i agree with all the points you guys have made but I think the underlying issue for any team that wants to make a long playoff run is depth. If we look at our running back situation, we are stacked. If we get Marlon back, Mac to come back, we have Jonathan Taylor and Naheem Hines as our three running backs. That's a solid squad. If one goes down, we're okay. If we look at the playoff teams that have happened this year, if we look at Green Bay, Green Bay had a solid, they were like, what, number two offensive line in the league? Solid offensive line. Come playoff time, they start to get hurt. They have to sign people as replacements. It doesn't help them. If we look at Kansas City, two guys on that squad offensive line, down for the count. Look at the Colts right now. Who are we going to replace for Costanzo for left tackle? We don't have anybody in the depth. Well, granted, he is, he was one of the best left tackles in the league for a while. It's hard to replace him. We can do that in the draft. It's going to be a stacked O line draft for left tackles. But I think depth and just making sure we have players that can step up, look at our tight ends. We have three good tight ends. They all have the same stats almost. It's perfect. We just get some wide receiver draft. We get some O line depth. And we get some depth probably for safeties and corners. That were solid. All right, Sade, it is your time to shine. We are shifting from the NFL to the NBA. We are in the we're, we're up and running. We're going. We're past the quarter mark. We're not quite to the halfway mark yet, but we are. The picture is, I think, starting to take shape of what we may see come playoff time. Um, obviously, still plenty of time. Things are going to change. Thing races are tight. Nothing's decided yet. But I think you're starting to see the cream rise to the top. So let's take a quick look at the season so far. And the first thing I want to point out is actually not about the team that I'm wearing on my chest, the Indiana Pacers. I want to talk about the Phoenix Suns because they have been a lot of fun to watch. Uh, They've had a couple of cold streaks, but a couple of hot streaks. They look really good. And I was really excited when they brought in Chris Paul. I thought it was a brilliant move to pair him with Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton, because if you take those three, that's a big three right there. I don't know on paper who's going to, who you match up with them. I obviously, now you look at Brooklyn. I mean, it's hard to match up with James Harden, Kyrie Irving and Kevin Durant, but you know, coming into the season, I was legitimately trying to be like, man, what's a better big three than point guard, Chris Paul, a shooting guard and Devin Booker and the center to tie it all together in DeAndre Ayton. So the Suns really intrigued me coming into the season. Don't get there. The only undefeated team in the bubble last year, that's a banner that's going to hang forever. So, I mean, you know, and they, and they've backed it up this season uh, with some solid play. They've had two different four game winning streaks this season. CB three and Devin Booker are in fact gelling. Like I think fans hoped they would DeAndre Ayton, I think still, He's still he, he's he, it's like Miles Turner where I don't think anybody realizes how young these kids are and I I call them kids for a reason because they are just that. I mean DeAndre Ayton is twenty two at the most, 
right now. So, I mean, he still has a lot to learn in the league. He's still growing into what it means to be an NBA player and an NBA big. And I honestly, I think it's tough right now to decide what an NBA big is because there's a lot of different ways you can play that kind of position. You know, the four or the five, it, it, it's just, it's a, it's, a, it's a revolving door of a position and it, it never stops evolving and changing, but I've been really impressed with them. They're sitting right now, I believe at 15 and nine, and they're currently the four seed in the West as of, as of this recording, as of, um, you know, Friday night, Saturday. So th- they've definitely balled out this year. Um, they're figuring things out on the fly and they're looking good doing it. And man, those Valley jerseys this year, shoo like fire all right Clean. those things are fire so yeah that's that's been one of the most impressive uh little fun stories of the year so far Tade. all right i'll go first i guess um <laughs> yeah the suns are fourth seed in the in the west who would have thought about it but one team i think is exceeding expectations this year is the Charlotte Hornets. Hmm. Drafted three last year, grabbed LaMelo Ball, signed Gordon Hayward. We have an alert from ESPN saying I'm right, obviously. <laughs> but I think the Charlotte Hornets staying at 13 and 14 right now, succeed in the East, have a solid chance of making the playoffs after missing it for what, past three years, four years? At least. It's been a while. Least. They don't really have a center a right now. Uh, Cody Zeller keeps getting hurt and coming out. And then Bismack Keeps posterizing Biombo. people. This is true. And then Bismack Biombo is, uh, he's all right. He's a good backup, but I think they're really the shocker of the season for most improvement. See, I'm going to take it back a little bit of a step, and I want to talk about the Washington Wizards. <sighs> How a team could go from getting into the postseason, getting Russell Westbrook. And going six and sixteen. What? And the worst part is, is that you figure with a guy like Westbrook, he's the alpha dog, right? Like he's usually the stat sheet stuffer. He's the one leading the team every game. No, that's been Bradley Beal. Westbrook's just there, and he's had some great games, but overall, it just doesn't seem like he's pulling his weight. And defensively, the team as a whole is just bad, man. The game that they won that was super impressive was still, what, 149 to 148? Like, it was still – there was no defense played. Now, great, that's fun. But as a guy who, like, takes pride in pace or basketball and wants to see tough defense, you can't continue to have these games come down to the wire because you're not playing defense. Because you go up against anybody who even plays a shred of defense, you are toast. And their 6-16 six and 16 record shows that. Yeah, absolutely. And to jump on that train, I mean, you talk about, you know, when you talk playoff basketball, defense shows up. Offense comes and goes in spurts. Defense ends up winning series more often than not. So if you can't, if you can't, in the words of your star, Bradley Beal, if you can't guard a parked car, you're in trouble as it is. And uh, I know we all are Pacers fans. Let's give a Big shout out real quick to the not so shocking growth of number 33, Mr. Miles Turner. How much fun has it been to watch him this year with a new coach, a new system? I was, I feel so like vindicated because I was clamoring all off season after we brought in new Nate. I was sitting here saying like, this is going to be great for Miles Turner. This is going to be such a breath of fresh air for that man. This is going to be such a way to just kind of take, take the shackles off of him and let him do his thing, let him be kind of the unicorn basketball player that he can be, where, no, he's not a tough guy. He is not a stand under the rim, come at me, I will feast on you down here, and I'm going to bury you with rebounds after rebounds, beat you up down here. That's not his game. His game is more finesse, perimeter. He loves to shoot the three. He loves to play out the perimeter. He loves to basically play center field and go block these shots by just coming up out of nowhere or meeting somebody at the rim and, and flying behind them or any, you know, doing these. He just, he absolutely loves 
the, the modern NBA offensive system and defensive system that new Nate has brought in. And it's been such a breath of fresh air to watch him grow so exponentially just in these 20 or so games that we've seen so far this year. I mean, the big thing that I've seen from him was there was a stretch where he had more blocks per game than most franchises at a certain stage. He went up from 2.1 blocks per game to three and a half. That's a big change. And he is just impacting more shots than I think I've ever seen him do it. And I'll have to agree. New Nate is letting Miles be Miles. Let him do his thing. And he is just absolutely thriving in this system. And it is so good to see him that he finally gets the recognition that he deserves. Because he went from being a top 10 center to a top five center in one year. Miles Turner is a, let's say, $25 million a year player. He's getting paid about $18 million right now, but he's worth $25 million. Rudy Gobert out there right now, he's going to make $40 million next year. Miles Turner is better than Rudy Gobert right now. I'll say it. Pacers are in a little bit of a rut right now. We'll go into that a little bit later, but Miles Turner is worth every penny the Pacers are playing. He is part of that big three, Brogdon, Domas, him. Period. Yeah, it, it's just been so much fun to watch him and the rest of the Pacers. They they have been fun. I know they they're in that bad stretch, and like you like you alluded to, we will talk about them. We will deep dive into them and figure out what's going on. But right now, we're going to talk some uh, early season awards race leaders, and that is a mouthful. So I'm only going to say it the one time. Um, we're gonna. I mean, let's let's jump right in with the big one, MVP, and it, it's it's too easy. It's just too easy for him. It, it's LeBron James. And then it's the field. And I would take LeBron James. I mean, he is just, it, he's LeBron James. It's like, it's like, uh, it's like that indie writer. I think it was Mike Chappell who called in for, to give Peyton Manning's case to the hall of fame committee. And he called in and he said, he's Peyton Manning and hung up the phone. Like who, who's, <laughs> who's, who's the most valuable player in the NBA? LeBron James, have a good one. You, you can debate it all you want. You can look at the stats. You can go into the deep dive. You can find the advanced stats. You can say, well, there's no way because uh, X doesn't equal Y and, and all these. Th- Dude, watch the games. Watch basketball. It's LeBron James right now. And trust me, I don't like saying that. See, I'm going to have to shift away from that. I'm going to have to go with Steph Curry because Chef Curry is carrying <laughs> the entire Warriors franchise on his back again. And he's just been going off. Now, LeBron's great, but I I feel like I really have to play the devil's advocate just because LeBron's won MVP. How many times? Doesn't matter. I don't, I don't think he needs another one. I'm going to have to go with the chef, the chef Curry, because if you look at the weapons around LeBron and you look at what's around Steph right now, I think it's easily who's the most valuable player to their team right now. LA could lose LeBron. You still have 80. If Golden State loses Steph, who else is there right now? Clay Thompson out. Uh, Draymond Green. James Wiseman's a baller, dude. James Wiseman's good, but he's not the take over a game for a team type of player yet. I think he's going to be. So and he was one of my sleeper picks coming out of the draft, but I don't think he's going to be that guy yet. So you're you're, you're giving the you're giving the MVP nod to uh, Steph Curry because he's he's put this franchise on his back and he's doing good things for him and he's carrying him all the way to the eight seed right now at fourteen and twelve. Man, what a legend! Get him in the dance. Get him in the dance. That. The West is tough. Get him in the dance. And he it's shows up cool. barely. Barely. Michael's an MVP voter. He would vote for Carmelo Anthony <laughs> over LeBron James. <laughs> You would be that one guy that voted for Carmelo over LeBron James I mean, with that same argument. Boy, if you look at what he's doing in Portland before. right now, who's <laughs> Damian Lillard? The team is obviously ran by Carmelo <laughs> Anthony, double zero. He's what is, got this. What is this game time? It's Mellow City, baby. This is ridiculous. <laughs> for those unaware in basketball, LeBron James <laughs> was not the first unanimous MVP. Steph Curry was. Mm-hmm. It's only because... One voter for MVP decided Carmelo Anthony 
while he was on the New York Knicks, was the most valuable player. You could say he was the most valuable player for his team, but LeBron was the best in the league and the best player on his team still. But that one guy decided, nah, Carmelo this time. And that's why LeBron James did not get unanimous MVP before Steph Curry. Michael is that one voter for MVP right <laughs> now. LeBron we James is the best player, and he is the MVP for the Lakers and in the league. The, he's, what, 35 years old? And he's putting up stats like he's 26. Yeah. The man is incredible. I will give a shout-out, though, to Joel Embiid, um... who, with a new coach, new GM, new system, Playing phenomenal. The Sixers are 18 and 8 right now, first in the East. He is balling out. He's playing the best ball of his career. He's in his prime. If it was just MVPs in the East, Joel Embiid. But LeBron James exists. <laughs> Steph Curry, honorable mention as well. I'd still pick Joel over Steph because their record is better, the team is better. Yeah, sure, Steph Curry's playing with an injured hobble team that's over the cap because they spent so much money on players that are adequate. Andrew Wiggins. (laughs) but (laughs) Kelly Oubre. (laughs) Exactly. So, LeBron James, I'm with Chris on this. Yeah. I mean, I'd go Donovan Mitchell before I'd go Steph Curry. Yeah, Spider-Man's great. Utah Jazz are number one seed right now. A game over the a game over the Lakers. So, but we're all right. All right, that's that. Obviously, got us a little heated. Let's let's reel it in. Let's reel it in. We're gonna uh, we're gonna talk about defensive player of the year. And I think we had to throw this one in there because, man, you got to give it to our boy, right? It's got to go to Miles Turner. Oh, I don't I mean, think anybody's man, gonna doubt that. The man is out on a mission. He has come out and stated like he wants that title. He wants defensive player of the year and damn it all. He is playing like the defensive player of the year. And it's not, it's not just block shots. The, 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 I know a lot of national guys are like, Oh, well, it's just block shots. You got to look at di- you know, different numbers and bigger metrics. Fine. Look at him. He's leading that defensive unit. As Michael mentioned earlier, he's altering more shots than ever, let alone blocking them. I mean, he is actually out there instilling fear in opposing offenses to go into the rim. I mean, he is, he's taken what Roy Hibbert used to be for the Pacers to an entirely another level. And he's just the, the biggest calling in that defensive system in Indy right now. So I, I give it to, I really do give it to Miles Turner. Yeah, I, I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna doubt that you said it perfectly. And for the sake of time, I'm gonna go ahead and pass the baton because if it's anybody other than Miles Turner, I will riot. Oh <laughs> well, don't come over and burn down my house because uh, Anthony Davis is having oh quite God. a defensive year for himself with the Lakers, while they have lost uh, Dwight Howard, a good. Great defensive player for them last year. While we do have Mark Gasol on the Lakers this year, uh, Anthony Davis is just out here whining and dining for himself on rebounds and playing in the paint. He's fifth right now in block shots at 1.9. Miles Turner's obviously the leader of that, but I just think playing on-ball defense, Anthony Davis is, is out there right now. He's just doing well. Respect. I got that. So... We're going to look at Rookie of the Year, um, and I'll make this pretty simple right now. Uh, Toddy mentioned them earlier. You know, the Charlotte Hornets are being led by a, a, a kid, a child, a young young man at the ripe age of 19 in LaMelo Big Ball. Baller brand. <laughs> in LaMelo Ball, he's come in, and he, is, he has shown a lot of potential. His ceiling is extremely high. I'll give it – uh, I'll, I'll say I was wrong. His ceiling is a lot higher than I thought it would be because um, I thought he just kind of got hype off his name, but not necessarily what he could do with the basketball, but he is out here. Uh, he is in the record books, folks. He is the youngest player ever to record a triple-double, so mad respect, much props. He uh, he is my running uh, leader for Rookie of the Year right now. And I just want to point out, y'all made fun of me when I took him in our fantasy basketball draft and I said, that he, this man is going to be the rookie of the year because I didn't, his scoring was always a bit of a question mark. I didn't know how that would translate, yeah. but his playmaking 
has been there. It has been consistent, and it has been a so just so fun to see that man looking like Steve Nash with more athleticism. Like it's just crazy to see them out there going out there and play ball. Like Lonzo, who at this stage, my only question that's left is, did Lavar and MJ finally settle who would win in a one on one? Like, is that done? I think I saw a stat earlier today that LaMelo Ball is balling out so hard. If you compare him to other players at his age, he's the best. Wow. Look at the kid. He's playing a professional league like it's a high school game with how flashy his stunts are. Sure, the coach complained that he didn't play defense coming down the end of the game, and that's why he was on the bench. But he's starting now because they realized he's that good. It's a little ball. It's a negative. It's minus 500 if you bet on him right now on DraftKings for him to be rookie of the year. They even know he's rookie of the year. There you go. Stamp it. Cut it. We're good. Last award we're going to talk about is coach of the year. I got to tip my cap to uh, one Mr. Quinn Snyder leading those Utah Jazz. They look like a legitimate, I kid you not, they look like a legitimate NBA Finals threat right now. They are currently the one seed in the West, and they have earned every bit of that top seed. Uh, as of Thursday, they got the best record in basketball at 20 and 5. So think about that. They're winning 80% of their games right now. They're winning four out of every five games. And I mean, and they've got they've got the NBA recipe for a success. They're, I mean, obviously, you know, the record's great. That whole roster is solid. You've got some good bench players, but you're led by stars. You're led by Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert. And when you're led by stars in this league, man, success comes with that. And they are showing you this year that they are they are serious. They are out for some vengeance. They are out to prove that they should not be overlooked. And Teams better start waking up to them real quick or they're going to be in trouble. And the Jazz have been electric. I will definitely say that, but they've had the talent to do that. And it's fine. I'm glad to see them actually do it. And it's crazy to see Donovan Mitchell just do the crazy things that he does. But I'm going to give the award no bias to new Nate because of the jump and the growth that he's had in his players since taking over not based purely off wins and losses. Cause I think they're going to come in the end, but seeing guys like Sabonis who has always been great. He had the all-star game last year. And now I have, I think he has the potential to really take over. And then you have miles Turner who should be defensive player of the year. And the Malcolm Brogdon's playing out of his, out of his mind right now, the bench unit's playing well and cohesive most of the time. So it's just one of those things where I think wins and losses are going to come back. But if you want to talk about a team that has, has definitely has gotten, the, I'm sorry, a coach that has gotten the most out of his team and has really helped them progress and really start seeing their true potential. It's got to be new name. Um, you know, I agree with both of those. They're obviously contenders. One guy I'm looking at right now is doc rivers um, with what he's done with, you know, the 76ers. I do think coming down the stretch, uh, the 76ers will start to crack a little bit. And we obviously have to see how he does in the playoffs. You know, Doc Rivers, you can be a good season coach, but come time for the playoffs, classic Doc Rivers, you're going to choke. Sure. Monty Williams, though, also on my radar for coach of the year, just because how he's brought the bubble suns into season. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why Chris didn't mention Monty Williams, but I think he's doing great as well. Yeah, Coach, you really. I just it, it's just been it, 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 it's just been Quinn Snyder has just I mean it's just that little bit so far that that has separated them and the, and and it does kind of boil down to the win loss record for me. Just I'm just I'm I'm so so happy and surprised that they're the number one seed right now. It's hard to overlook that. And you know you talk about new Nate and the, I think the most important thing when you talk about him, Michael, is just to mention the fact that this is his first head coaching gig ever. So it's not like he's just new to the Pacers or he's a new head coach of the Pacers. He's a brand new head coach. And the fact that his players have already bought into his system so much really speaks volumes to me. 
So next, we're still on the NBA train. We got a lot to talk about. Like I said, we're in basically in mid-season form, and uh, I want to talk about the most disappointing start so far. Like who has just really just n- kind of knocked you back with you know how they've how they played so far. And for me, it's those Denver Nuggets. As of Thursday, they're currently holding just the seventh seed in the West with a pretty shocking thirteen and eleven record. They're just two games over 500. The reason this is so shocking to me is you got to remember, this is a team that is coming off of a Western Conference Finals appearance last year against the Lakers. Like, and they played the Lakers pretty well in that series. Everybody knew the late, like the Lakers, they they were going to do what they ended up doing and winning it all. Uh, But I mean, they played really well just to get to that point and to compete against the Lakers because the other thing I remember about last year for them is they're in a playoff run where they came back from a three games to one deficit twice in back-to-back rounds in the first round against those Utah jazz that are currently the one seed. They were down three to one stormed back, ended up winning game seven by two points, 80 to 78, like a super low scoring game and knocking out the jazz. And then they came back against like Todd, I mentioned Doc Rivers and his Clippers. They came back down three, one and the clip, we saw the Clippers. I mean, not crack. They imploded in that series turned on each other. I mean, it was nasty. Wow. That series when the dust settled on that series, but you, so I'm really surprised. Cause I mean, you've got the pieces there in Denver to be playing better than this. And we're, we're well into the season now where they should be, rising to the top not sputtering out like this i mean you talk about jokic he's playing at an mvp level nearly 27 points a game he's got 11 rebounds and nearly nine assists a game he's almost averaging a triple double but he needs some contributions from the rest of his guys bench starters everybody needs to step up a a, a notch or two to get this team really rolling and to see if this team can pick it up and make another deep playoff run in what is a stacked western conference and I mean, it's the Western Conference in general, like you already said, it's stacked. And a team that I thought was really going to take the leap this year was the Dallas Mavericks. Because you're going to have Luka, you have the Unicorn and Kristaps Porzingis, and I thought they were really going to go on a run. And even though early in the year I knew they were going to struggle because Kristaps was out, he had an injury, and he was trying to come back from that, Luka was still being Luka. Luka was still getting this team in games that they had no business being in whatsoever. And yet they're, they're 12 and 14 with the talent they've had going on. The Luca and Kristaps Porzingis has been a little spotty and they need to get that worked out because if those two can gel and gel consistently, they should keep themselves from going the outside looking in to the five or the four seed easily by the end of the year. Yeah, definitely has pointed out some disappointing teams. Um, I'm going to go with the Orlando Magic because... Well, they were a playoff team. They're a playoff caliber team. They come into the season, they're below the Knicks in the rankings right now. Knicks are in the playoffs and they're 9 and 17. Orlando has just not picked up the ball this year. Uh, I don't know what it is. Maybe it's coaching. You know, maybe it's because some of the players are already at their limit of what they can do. I understand that uh, Markel Fultz is out for the year. That was a big hurt for them. You know, but maybe they should try something at the trade deadline before that happens. Try to get some more talent in there just so they can stay alive. All right. It's our favorite time of the NBA segment. We're going to, we're going to, we're going to deep dive. We're going to talk about our Indiana Pacers. And I wish this was at a better time and a brighter spot in the year. So we could just kind of gush over a new Nate and Brogdon stepping up and Turner doing what he's doing. But man, if we're going to do this show, we're going to do it right. So right now, as it stands, we got to talk about what the hell is wrong with the Indiana Pacers. So the bright note that I'll start off with is they did finally bounce back from a four game losing streak on Thursday night against Detroit. They ended up winning that game a 111 to 95 to get back to 500 where they're sitting as of this moment as we record. So their next game, Saturday night in Atlanta. I wish I could say that'd be an easy game and it should be an easy game if they were playing at a higher level right now. But man, right now I'm kind of on pins and needles every time they step out of the court because you just kind of don't know what's going to happen or what's going to, you know, what, how they're going to look. So 
I just I'll I'll ask the question again. What is wrong with the Pacers right now? I'm starting to feel like this is like they're playing down to their opponents when they should be dominating games. The Pacers have had a track record going back a few years where they just kind of play down to their competition. Now, Atlanta's not a team to scoff at anymore, especially with Trey Young being, well, Trey Young. But that's a game that they should handle. They have more weapons. They have a strong defensive unit, and yet they're getting sometimes, like, what was it? They scored like 35 points and a half. Like, the offense has been up and down like a roller coaster, and it has to be something they have to figure out, especially on the bench side, because you can't just leave it all up to Sabonis and Brogdon to get all of your offense. Other people have to contribute on there as well. Practice, practice, practice. We ain't talking about practice. practice. I'm going to talk about practice. Levert is coming back. He's starting to practice with the Pacers. The Pacers are practicing, not like they're trying to play, but what their future is going to hold. He's already started practicing with the main team. I think just that the Pacers, when they're practicing, they're not practicing with the team they're playing with. They're practicing with the team they're going to be playing with. And so that's starting to hurt them. We also have to look at the fact that uh, one of the Pacers coaches has resigned recently due to deaths in the family causing some mental stress. Prayers out to him. Mm -hmm. Right decision for him to make. 100%. 100%. That's trying to, that's going to hurt the paces a little bit because obviously that team's tight, especially with COVID in place. Everyone's more closer together this year than before. So obviously that's hurting them right now. They'll bounce back. Yeah. And I mean, you know, I mentioned that they, uh, right of the ship, they ended that four game losing streak, but I want to give them credit because that four game losing streak, it's easy to just look at that and be like, oh, wow, they lost four in a row. They're a bad team. If you look at who they played in that four-game stretch, they were in Milwaukee and lost by 20. They got blown out in that game, had no chance. It was on a back-to-back after they handled Memphis the night before. So they handled Memphis at home. The next night, they have to travel to Milwaukee. Milwaukee's fresh. Indy's not. Chalk it up. Yeah, They lose a one-point game to the Pelicans at back at home on f- last Friday. Oh. And... That was a game, you know, they were down 18 going into the fourth. Their new Nate makes the decision to go to his bench because the starters are playing like they don't know what a basketball looks like. And the the starters or the bench rather brings them all the way back. And they took the lead late in that game. And new Nate made the decision to leave the, the bench in because they were the hot hand and they ended up losing by one. It's a, it becomes a controversial decision because they lost the game, not because it was the right or wrong decision. It's because they lost the game because if he had made the decision to go to his starters and they continue to play like poop and they lost, everybody would ride him and say, well, you should have just stuck with the hot hands on the bench. So it's, it, it's a hard decision to make and it's easy to say it was the wrong decision and a loss. So then after that brutal loss, they play that one seed in the West jazz and lose by eight. And then They go to Brooklyn. They only scored 30 points in the first half and end up making it a 10 point game, by the way. So, I mean, they they had a really tough stretch there in those four games and some things didn't roll their way. And it's basketball. You're going to lose games. You're going to win games. It's up and down. It's a roller coaster of a season. It's much like baseball, Michael and I know. So, I mean, I want to give him credit to, you know, it would have been nice to win one of those games just to kind of balance it out. But realistically, those are four tough games and it sucks that they all broke against the Pacers, but I I do think they'll write the ship. I'm not worried as worried as you could be where they're sitting right now. Um, I think things are still gelling. Todd made a great point about the health of the team kind of working its way back in big shout out to Jeremy lamb coming back. He has looked great coming back, you know, post injury, super happy to see him back on the courts. Been awesome. He's shooting so good right now, over 50% from the field, over 50% from three, 97% from the free throw line. I mean, he is a shooting stud right now. So I, I, I trust in this system that they've put in place. It's a much better system in my opinion than um, what Nate McMillan had running the last few years. So hopefully it, it gels this year before it gets too late to make a real playoff run. We'll just have to see how it goes. Um, Michael, it's time. We're going to our, – our, fi- our big final segment of the night. We're talking baseball, and you know what? Michael, get us going because I, I got I to gotta do something real quick. I got to change some attire if we're going to be talking baseball. Okay. So 
Go right ahead. All right. So I definitely want to get started on some of the big moves that were made this past offseason. Slam Diego finessed some people to get guys like you Darvish in there. And they have definitely reloaded and they're on pace to hopefully overtake the Dodgers. Then the Dodgers go ahead and sign the best pitcher available on the market in Trevor Bauer. Makes me sad, but it's Trevor Bauer's home. It's what he wanted to come back to. And I understand it. Even though we kind of, there was a merchandise mishap and they were accused of leaving the Mets at the altar. Like, it's just ridiculous. Um, then you got guys who I didn't expect to move. Nolan Arenado got traded into, <laughs> into the Cardinals for nothing. The Rockies got hosed for the best third baseman in baseball. They didn't get a Dylan Carlson. They didn't get a top tier prospect or even a guy who would match that kind of performance. They got hosed for Nolan Arenado. And it's just crazy to see some of these moves that are being made. And the MLB definitely needs to kind of step in and go, Hey guys, stop salary dumping. Like it's not fun for your fans to see your team intentionally shoot themselves in the foot. Uh, one of the main that comes to mind, one move was the trade where the Yankees got Jameis Italian for nothing for cash and some players to be named later. They got him for nothing yeah. as a salary camp dump by Pittsburgh. And it's ridiculous. Well, and you know, and it raises the question, why is a team like Pittsburgh salary dumping? They're not in contention. They're not doing anything this year. Why, why, why do they feel the need to salary dump? So, I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, it, MLB needs to do something about trades. We've seen too many of it. And at the end of the day, it's souring the product unless you happen to be a fan of one of the teams that gets these guys. I mean, if you're a fan of the Padres, you don't want nothing to change. <laughs> you say, let's keep it rolling. We're good. We're fine. But if you're a, if you're a Cubs fan, if you're a Reds fan who watches Bauer walk out the door, if you're a Rockies fan, I mean, if you're a Rockies fan who's poured your heart and soul into that team and watched and loved Nolan Arenado for what he did for that franchise, just to be shipped off for half a bag of chips that were stale and left on the counter for three weeks. I mean, that hurts. And as a Cubs fan, watching a guy like you Darvish resurrect a very good career already, resurrect it, take it to another level, finish second place in the Cy Young last year behind Cincinnati Reds pitcher uh, Trevor Bauer, uh, you know, just to see him shipped off for, again, a bag of chips for 17 and 18 year old kids who, who knows? Yeah, maybe in five years they'll be MLB level players. But man, I don't know if you're aware, but you Darvish is an MLB level player today. He's an elite, elite starting pitcher still. And he was, I mean, and he loved Chicago. He had so much fun. His social media presence was like, like it broke my heart to watch him leave. And I mean, <laughs> you just got to do something. You just got to do something because it, it, this is this is the start, not the end. This is just the start of these kind of trades going down. I mean, you're going to see teams say, "Why not? If we can, if they can do this, if we're if teams, if we don't have to give up our top prospects, and we can bring in superstar level guys, and just throw the checkbook at them, what's to stop us? So somebody's at some point, somebody's got to step in. Um, Trevor Bauer, you know, he he he's a character. He's a lot of fun. Uh, he is a fun to watch. He's an elite pitcher in this league. Um, very fun dude. A lot of just a great kind of guy. Yeah, I'm. I, man, if you're the Padres and you're what and you're bringing in all these guys and you're like, yeah, we're we're closing that gap and say, you know, to to L.A. And then L.A. I mean, how long do you think L.A. was sitting back and just watching the Padres go? That's cute. Oh, that's <laughs> cute. Oh, that's a good move. Oh, that's a really good move. By the way, uh, we just signed Trevor Bauer. Yeah, we're going to pay him four Brinks trucks for this year, but we, we got Trevor Bauer. So, I mean, man, that, that's going to kind of – that's going to be a salty one for the Padres because, damn, that hurts. And I know the Mets are bummed too. Um, so – but it's tough. But I, I had to rant about my Cubs for a minute. Uh, first things first. I want to show off. I was like, right here, 2016 World Series title, man. 
never taken it away. They won it all. They did it. It was amazing. This patch from the hat, Super World Series, like, oh, breaks my heart. Like thinking about that, like I literally like it brings me to tears thinking about that 2016 team, that 2016 run. It's so special. It's it's so pure. I hope. I mean, I hope nothing comes out in 20 years that says they cheated, they did something wrong. Like like I, that story is so pure and good and amazing. I hope, you know, nothing can break it. Uh, even the the the, the Addison Russells of the of the world can't can't break that deal. So, um, but man, I'm salty. I as the Cubs fan, I'm not happy. Um, I, to be the third biggest market in baseball and to come out here and cry poor pisses me off. It pisses me off. And I've dealt with seasons going into a season where I knew this team, my Cubs are going to lose a hundred games. And I had way more fun in the off seasons leading into those seasons than I am in this off season, because my heart is broken. No fewer than 11 times in the last three months, um, watching, Darvish get traded for nothing watching Lester essentially beg to come back to the Cubs and the Cubs say, sorry, we can't pay you. And for them to fight Kyle Schwarber in arbitration and then just decide not to pay him and to watch him then sign a deal with Washington for more money than the Cubs would have had to pay him in arbitration is infuriating. And then to watch them take Ian Happ to arbitration over one and a half million dollars that they couldn't agree on are you kidding me? And then to hear the constant Chris Bryant rumors and the constant Wilson Contreras rumors, like, and they still haven't extended Rizzo or Baez. I mean, or Kyle Hendricks. I mean, what is team doing? I don't understand. It really, it, it, it just hurts to be a fan of them right now. It it just, it, it doesn't feel good. There is some bright news Cubs fans. They've made some moves this post this off season, they semi replaced Kyle Schwarber by bringing in uh, former Dodgers outfielder Jock, Jock Peterson on a one year, seven ish million dollar deal. I don't know a lot about the finances. There's there's some incentives. There's some mutual buyouts crap for a second year, blah, blah, blah. He's going to get some money. He's going to get millions of dollars. Um, they brought they signed a. Uh, uh, Trevor Williams, former Pittsburgh Pirates pitcher um, to a deal to a one year deal. They brought Andrew Schaffin back, Chafin back on a one year deal and they yesterday signed uh, Jake Marisnik on a one-year deal. And it's really funny this week, you know, we typed up our outline. We're working, we're getting ready for the podcast and in all caps, I typed out, bring back Jake Arietta, you cowards. All right, do it. And then about an hour before we record this podcast, holy hell, they did it. They listened to me. Jake Arrieta is coming back to the north side on a one-year deal, and I am ecstatic. It literally almost makes up for the entire offseason of BS and crap that I've been hearing. It's the light at the end of the tunnel leading into the season. It's, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I'm so excited. Like, it it almost brought me to tears when that when that news broke on my phone at, like an hour before we recorded. I almost was moved to tears because I was just so excited, especially because like a couple of hours ago, I saw something that was like eh, an area to Cubs reunion is not likely. And I was like, of course, it's not because he wants money and the Cubs won't give him money. They wanted to sign him for food expenses like the, to be like, hey, did you just want to come back and hang out like, oh, wait, you want us to pay you? Oh, uh, that's rough. So. I'm super excited. It doesn't make up for all the things they did this off season. And I'm still unhappy with the majority of it, but God damn bringing Jake Arrieta back means a lot to this Cubs fan. And I know every Cubs fan who watched him pitch and revitalize his career. That was dead left for dead in the water out of Baltimore. Come back and just um, do what he hopefully come back and do what he can. I know he can do and perform again. It, it's going to be special. It's going to be really special to watch him in pinstripes at Wrigley once again. I'm super excited. And I'm excited for you because for me as a Reds fan, that'd be the same equivalent as the Reds going out and get bringing back Johnny Cueto or Roldis yep. Chapman. It's that level of excitement from a guy who had probably the best seasons in that stadium. Now, Jake Arrieta was okay in Philly, he was okay. And to bring him back to Chicago, a team, a franchise that really believes in him and a fan base that will be there and support him, that's that's exciting. But speaking of moves, I want to know what who you think is going to get moved next. What superstore? What what one more? What what big trade happens before spring training fully kicks off in a couple of weeks, actually? 
So it breaks my heart. So I'll leave it short and simple. It, it literally breaks my heart just to even have typed it out and to now be speaking it into existence. But I think Chris Bryant gets moved. Um, the Cubs and the Mets are in talks once again. They've already talked about it before. Um, and the Mets seem to be, ever since they brought Steve Cohen in, they seem to be buying, 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 and in let's put a team together. Let's put a, a competitive team out there and try to win some damn baseball games and go to the playoffs. And it, so I think the Mets are hungry for it. Uh, they need to upgrade at third base. Why not go get a guy like KB if they can and all the power to him if they can make it happen. And I just hope, I, I just don't want it to happen as a selfish Cubs fan. I, I love Chris Bryant uh wholeheartedly and i it, it does break my heart to even hear his name in rumors once again and i know he doesn't like it either I, I know he just wants to go out there and play baseball and he wants to be in chicago he wants to be with anthony rizzo he, he he has said before he wants to spend his career there and and it just it, it's got to hurt for him to 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 want that and then to have the organization say well we're gonna see what we can get for you and it's just a hurtful thing to see a guy who's completely bought in and because, like, oh, no, we're so poor. Like, it's just sad. You're going to trade away the guy who's probably the Chicago Cub outside of Javi right now. And it's just a weird thing to see because I've seen him a lot in Blue Jays talks because the Blue Jays are really trying to get the team together, especially the guy who's as versatile as Chris Bryant because you already have a guy like Vladdy at third. So you bring in a guy who can play in the outfield a little bit to compliment uh, Springer out there. That's going to be, that's going to be an interesting, interesting matchup to see if he does move. But I think just talking about earlier, when we were talking about salary dumping, I think the Yankees are going to move on from a world as Chapman because he can't stay healthy and he has an expensive contract. I do and the New York is New York. You know, the New York, we got the money to pay everybody. Don't worry about it. But it's just something where I think that enough is enough and they need to invest in a guy who I thought they were going to get, which is Sean Doolittle, who the Reds just picked up. So thank goodness. But I thought they were going to move on from him early and hopefully use that salary towards something else. But and hopefully, you know, maybe trade or oldest Chapman back to the Reds. I wouldn't have been mad, but. I just think that a role as Chapman is probably going to be in the outs because just because of health. And now we're going to transition to something. Tade, you've been quiet over there, but the floor is yours, my friend, my, my gambling addicted friend. I want to know what, like, what are your picks for this, for the night of the week, whatever you want to do. This is, this is your stage now. All right, ladies and gentlemen, I, as you can tell, am not an avid baseball fan. I'll follow it. I'll listen to the podcast for it. But Moneyball is the extent of what I know about baseball. Great movie. Great book. Thank you, Brad Pitt. Great Oscar for you. Good job. So looking at Saturday's games for the NBA, there's one game in particular. I know these bets will hit. I'm better than Barstool at picking these bets. The first bet, Domas Sabonis over 0.5 threes. Chris knows. Anytime I bet against him on three pointers, he always he always ruins me. The odds won't be too good. Minus two thirty on odds, you'll get lesser than half your payout. So if you bet a dollar, you'll get less than a dollar back in profit. It's not bad. Personally, I'll use DraftKings. Uh, they have great promos, frequent promos. In my opinion better than FanDuel. Make sure to check your uh, state to see if it's legal to gamble. If not, there's always overseas options for you. (laughs) Now, there is free money available right now if you want to bet. Right now, there is a hammer down special for the Lakers-Denver game coming up on Sunday. (laughs) If they score one point, congrats. You get $25 if you put $25 down. You can double your money and then waste it on some more bets. Because let me tell you, Jeremy Lamb, uh, plus 1.53s made, money. That man hits his threes, as Chris said earlier. I know we're coming to the end of the podcast here shortly, but let me tell you. Miles Turner, plus 1.5, that's a risky bet right there. I wouldn't hammer that down. Two ones I would hammer down, 
Domas hitting a three, and then Jeremy Land hitting at least two threes. Uh, coming up this week also, we have, in my opinion, a pretty good game that's going to be a sleeper. Uh, we got Pelicans-Pistons. I think that if you take the spread on the Pistons, you'll get your monies back. Uh, obviously, they fought the Lakers pretty well recently. You know, Pacers, that's coming up. That already came up. We won, so, I mean, tells you. But Pistons aren't a bad team, as the record shows. They'll cover the spread. And then later, we got the Raptors Bucks coming up on Tuesday. I'll take the Bucks on that one, unless somebody gets injured. And then we got also... Coming up here on uh, Saturday, we have Nets Warriors, who Draymond Green is Michael's favorite person. Uh, DeAndre <laughs> Jordan will be out for this game on Saturday at 8.30 on ABC. So we'll probably see Kevin Durant play some center. So if you want to bet the over on rebounds for Draymond Green and for Kevin Durant, because it's going to be over his average rebounds, I'd take those as well. All right, gentlemen. That's it for the picks. All right. And then I'm going to have to make this quick just because we are getting a little bit conscious of time. I am going to briefly talk about the NHL and the UFC. Tade and Chris, I know you guys aren't really big into that. Um, NHL, more of a casual fan on that. So really quickly, I just want to talk about how the Blue Jackets just cannot stop benching their stars. This would be the equivalent of the Pacers benching Sabonis for no random reason or benching LeBron James. Like that kind of level of talent just going, eh sit in the bench. It caused them to trade away their best player. Well, granted, they got another guy, another top guy, I gave him the name of Patrick Leanne. I hope I pronounced his name right. But he kind of played some soft defense. So instead of like coaching him up, just just bench him. You know, why not? Um, even though he has struggled, he's only got, he's gotten three goals in his first four games. His coach is adamant that it wasn't reason, but it's still just kind of weird to see. And I'm going to follow that later on. And we'll talk about it more in another episode. I really want to talk about the UFC because tomorrow is a big fight. The accountant Gilbert Burns against Usman, and it's just going to be a really fun fight to watch. Some other things that happened just briefly, um, Alistair Overeem, he was making another title shot. He got knocked the hell out in the second round, and I think he maybe has one last push in him, but he's 40. He's gotten beaten up. His losses have not been good. So I think he's almost done. Michael Chandler transferring over from Bellator where he's won multiple titles. He demolished Hooker in his first fight in the UFC on the uh, last pay-per-view. I'm excited to see if he's, he's going to fight next. I've been hearing Conor McGregor, Dustin Poirier, another big name fighter to get him into title contention and to take on Khabib or Poirier, whoever the title goes to Israel Adesanya, who's the next big pay-per-view fight outside of the one coming up tomorrow is going to be taking uh, bumping up his weight class. He's going to get adding 20 pounds which for a guy who's mainly style and finesse, bumping up 20 pounds has not worked well in the past, but I forgot anybody could do it. It's the last style bender, a man with Deadpool tattooed on his chest, Israel Adesanya. Um, Conor McGregor, big loss, disappointing loss. He wants a rematch with Dustin Poirier really bad, but I think he's going to go up against Michael Chandler, and if he does, proper number 12 is going to be the only thing that'll dry his tears after that fight. Um Khabib has been in and out of retirement. Like he officially retired, but he's been in and out of, Oh, sorry. He's unofficially retired, but he's been in and out of conversations to take on Poirier, even though he said that Poirier's earned the title shot. Now, briefly, I do want to talk about UFC 258 because that is my game to watch this weekend, which is a segment we're going to be doing every week to kind of point out some games that we think you guys should definitely pay attention to. And Gilbert Burns didn't get a shot last time against Guzman due to COVID-19. Jorge Masvidal had four days notice to come in and fight, which normally takes four weeks for a guy to get ready. This man is the real deal. He has heavy hands. He's 8-0 with submissions, so he can do it all. And Usman, his only loss has come from a submission. So he needs to keep this fight on his feet. And hopefully we get an all-out bloodbath. I'm just that kind of person becomes the UFC. And... I still think that Gilbert Burns, the accountant, is going to walk away with the title. And then I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Chris to cover his game to watch this week. 
So, as Michael alluded, I am not the biggest uh, UFC fan or NHL fan. I believe hockey is the one with the stick in the puck into the goal, correct? So on the on the on the ice, some yes. kind of frozen water kind of liquid thing. Okay, got it. Just making sure I've got my my stuff straight. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the game that I am probably most excited to actually sit down and watch, and I think the game that might kind of show the most when it comes to kind of what a playoff matchup might look like, not necessarily between these two teams, but where they, where they kind of sit currently in the season Tuesday night. I know a random Tuesday night. Um, it's going to be the Brooklyn nets against the Phoenix suns. Those are two of the, not necessarily powerhouses, but two top teams in their respective conference. As of Friday night, the Nets are sitting 15 and 12 in the number three seed in the East. And I don't know if you've heard, but the Brooklyn Nets have star power everywhere. They've got Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, and James Harden. I think they have some other players on that team. I'm not sure, but I don't think it matters. When you have those three guys, you're probably going to win more games than you lose. So it. And it's, and I know you can nitpick and say, well, who, there's only one ball, what, you know, they can't all do. It doesn't matter. Uh, I've played enough NBA 2K to know that you just get as many star guys on your squad as possible and you beef them up and then boom, oh my God, you're amazing at the game. So clearly that's what Brooklyn is doing. They're just playing my team and just trying to collect as many cards and players as they can. That's obviously what they're doing. And congrats, it's, it's working. The Suns. They're not lacking star power either, as we talked about, or as I talked about earlier in the podcast. They've got a big three of their own in Chris Paul, DeAndre Ayton, and uh, Devin Booker. I don't know if you've ever heard of him, but he only dropped 70 against Boston a couple of years ago and has done nothing since besides be a scorching hot scorer down there in the Valley. And they right now are sitting pretty at 15-9. and nine. They're the four seed in the West, like I said, as of Friday night, as of this recording. I just think this is a great matchup for both teams as kind of a measuring stick game to see where they're at. Um, you know, are the Suns pretenders or contenders? This is a this is a game that may elude you one way or the other. Is if they take down Brooklyn, man, that's got to feel good, and they can hang their hats on that one. Um, and really, just how good are these Nets with all of their star power? Are they a flash in the pan, real pretty? on paper looks good, but man, get them in a playoff series, beat them up and anybody can take them down. Or are they the real deal with a three, with a one, two, three punch that nobody is going to be able to match my prediction for this game. I think the Suns win a shootout because Brooklyn can't play defense. And I think it goes 130, 125 to the Suns. Lastly, my game of the week, uh, I'm going to go with, Friday the 19th, we have a rivalry game. We have the Mavericks versus the Rockets, two teams who are mediocre. <laughs> Woo! But fuck Victor Oladipo. We don't like Victor anymore, but I want the Mavs to well, we win can... this one. I think they're going to win this one. No, remember, we quit on him. We, we quit on Victor Oladipo. Yeah, guys, we quit on him. We couldn't trade for the people he wanted. We couldn't pay him $40 million a year. Oh, wait, we offered him twenty five because... That's a good price. We already paid him the most on the team already. But no, rivalry game on Friday, 8 o'clock on ESPN. (laughs) It's going to be a fight. And I love fights even more than the UFC. I like them in the NBA when they're tussling. (laughs) So who'd you you take to win that one? Oh, Mavericks. Mavericks. Okay. Okay. All right, guys. I think we did it. That's episode one. I think we did it. We're through, man. This is awesome. We got that weight off our chest. We did it. Um, not just speaking for my co host but I want to thank 3C Media for taking a shot on us, giving us this opportunity, giving us this platform to step out and, and spend a night, one night a week, just shooting the shit with the guys and talking sports, talking our stuff. Um, it, it's been a dream of mine. And I, I am just so excited to get this thing up and rolling and we're coming in every week. We'll be we'll be on YouTube every Saturday. So spend some of your weekend with us. We're we're gonna be just just shooting the breeze, talking sports, keeping up to date with all this stuff, and uh, we're gonna have fun doing it. That's for sure. Oh, yeah. And um, really, 
quickly, um, if I may, I was um, politely asked to shout out a GoFundMe of family that I'm aware I was going through some financial struggles as big thanks to the coronavirus. I will have their GoFundMe and the link below. Um, if there you can donate anything, I know they would really appreciate appreciate it. I was asked um, very kindly. I, of course, I will not reveal any details. That's their own personal business, but I was asked to shout that out. Um, so instead of doing like a little social sound out, I will be having their GoFundMe in the link below. Yeah, guys, and remember, you can, like I said, find us on YouTube every Saturday. Uh, you can also follow us on our individual social media pages. You can find me on Twitter at Mr. Topher. That's M-I-S-T-E-R-T-O-P-H-E-R 92 on Twitter for some uh, mild takes on sports and a lot of retweets of my favorite team's perfect tweets that they tweet out. And among other things, I promise it's not all sports. It's, it's life uh, on a Twitter feed. You can find me on Twitter at DriveTru, D-R-1-V-E-T-R-U, for some spicy memes and sports talk and really anything else. I just use Twitter to kind of dick around. And Tade doesn't use Twitter, so I guess you're going to shout out your FanDuel, right? I'm going to shout out my DraftKings Fantasy. Uh, if you guys want to challenge me or anything to a match, paid or not, you know, Toddle 5 on there, T-O-D-D-L-E 5. Cubs, 2016 title. Never taking it away. We'll see y'all next twenty one World Series champs. This has been the MC this has been the MCT podcast. Thanks for coming along.